The first question we're beginning with is what is the significance for ethics of uh, new knowledge of genetics? The new knowledge of genetics does not really change anything for ethics. Instead, it sets new questions for how to apply the ethics that we already have. In other words, in, in terms of the ethics that I hold, what we should be doing is looking at genetics as a tool to try and reduce unnecessary suffering where that presently exists and to try to make life better for all of us in terms of the values and goals that we hold. When I talk about um, making life better or relieving suffering, I'm not only talking about human beings, I'm talking about all sentient beings, all beings that are capable of suffering or of having their lives go better or worse. And this is, this is certainly relevant to the application of genetics to uh, non-human animals because uh, we have already seen attempts to apply this uh, in terms of developing farm animals that uh, it is hoped would be more productive, but very often the result is only that those animals um, become ill, uh, have crippling disabilities, uh, and live uh, even more miserable lives than those of uh, modern farm animals generally. So you might say that in respect of uh, genetics as applied to non-human animals, my ethic is, is more restrictive uh, than the standard ethic, which essentially says we can do anything to animals as long as it's useful for us. Traditionally, there has been a sense that we should not alter human genes in any way. You, we very often hear, for example, the accusation that if we do alter human genetics, we are playing God. We are taking a role which should only be God's and uh, taking that into human hands. But I, I, I don't accept this um, objection that, that we must not play God. Uh, in my view, we have always tried to improve our situation in whatever way is open to us. And this is another technology which we should also use to improve our situation. And uh, we should feel that uh, we should regard genetics as a tool which may be used for good uh, and, of course, could also be used for evil. But uh, the, the, the question should not be whether we should use it or not use it. The question should only be how we can control it so that it is only used for good purposes. At this stage of our science and for the foreseeable future, we can't really change the genetic identity of anyone who has um, moved beyond a very early embryonic stage of their life. All that we can perhaps do is to target certain uh, defective genes and try to replace individual genes that may have be causing some specific problems. And where there is a gene, uh, where, sorry, where, is, where there is a disease that is caused by a single gene, we may be able to do that. But that's only one tiny bit of information in uh, all of the genetics that makes up a particular person. So that's why the, the essential answer to your question is, no, we cannot change our genes um, in the way that we can change our address. I think uh, in the immediate future, the more important thing is not, so matter, uh, is not a matter of changing genes, but rather of selecting genes because we can already produce uh, several embryos, that is a couple who wish to have a child can produce certain embryos and can perform some, at this stage still rather limited, genetic tests on those embryos and then select which of the embryos they would like to be their next child. So this is not actually changing the genes but it is changing the genes of your next child, if that is, because that is a kind of indeterminate expression that could cover a number of possible children. And I think uh, this issue of selection is going to be more controversial and more ethically difficult for uh, at least the next decade than the issue of trying to change genes. It's a fairly easy uh, question when we are talking only about therapeutic cloning. Uh, and when we are, because we are talking about an embryo that consists of only a few cells, uh, it certainly cannot feel anything. 
It has no consciousness or no awareness. And I don't think that uh, it's the kind of being that has a right to life. So if there is some possible therapeutic benefit to patients with uh, serious diseases by uh, cloning this uh, embryo to obtain stem cells, uh, I don't see a moral problem with it. Uh, I don't see that this entity has this kind of moral status. In fact, a lot of people don't realize that um, millions of embryos are lost all the time in the course of the natural reproductive process. Um, that uh, probably uh, for every child born, um, maybe two embryos are lost on average. And nobody grieves about that, nobody worries about it. So I think to suddenly become very concerned about uh, the loss of a, a few thousand embryos to obtain stem cells which could help people is really to have a misplaced sense of concern for a kind of entity that does not really require us to have that sort of concern for it. Uh, I don't want to say that an embryo is not a human being in a prenatal stage. I think it is. I think there's no question that the embryo born of human parents from the moment of conception is a living human being. But I don't think the fact that it is a living human being means that it has a right to life. In my view, to have a right to life, you have to have certain minimal characteristics. You have to at least have some kind of consciousness or awareness. After all, uh, non-human animals uh, have consciousness and awareness. Um, so that's a minimal characteristic. But I would, I would suggest that to have a full right to life, that is the most serious kind of right to life, you have to have something even beyond that. That is that you have to have some sort of self-awareness, some sort of ability to see yourself as existing over time, because I think that that changes what it is that we do to you when we take your life. It, it's something that means that we are doing something contrary to preferences that the being has, um, which we cannot do in the case of a being who is not self-aware and does not have a sense of itself living a life. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just add one more remark about that which will indicate the, the kind of problem that could very soon arise. Um, at the university at which I now teach in the United States, which is a university that is highly selective, a private university where um, you have to perform very well academically to become a student, you can already see advertisements in the student newspaper by couples who are seeking a, a student of Princeton University or of a similar elite university who is willing to sell her eggs. Um, so they are offering, uh, I've seen as high as 25,000 US dollars for eggs from someone who fulfills certain special characteristics. Uh, a woman who has very high uh, scholastic scores, very good university results, uh, perhaps is fairly tall, um, is athletic, something of that sort. So we can see already how, at least in a free market economy, if this is permitted, and the United States is, of course, unusual in the extent to which it allows the free market to rule over many areas of life, uh, we can see how embryos could also be bought and sold because of specially selected characteristics. You have to remember it's a very slow method of changing society. I mean, if, if what you're doing is trying to genetically engineer the kind of people you want, um, it's going to take uh, 18 years before they're adults. So for a dictator, it's probably not of great interest. Um, they want to achieve power more quickly. But in a free market society, we can get this situation where rich people can buy themselves genetically superior children. And if this is not exactly a genetic feudalism, um, it's still a class society which then becomes genetically reinforced. And this does seem to me to be a serious threat, um, you know, a more more immediately probable threat in a society like the United States uh, and other societies that believe in an unregulated free market. So I think for that reason um, we would need to consider this question and if, it, if we get to the point where some people are using their money to buy genetically advantaged children, we would need to consider what we should do about it. And there are clearly two possibilities. We could prohibit the rich 
from using their resources to get genetically advantaged children, or we could subsidise the poor so that they can also have genetically advantaged children. And between those two possibilities, I don't really have a very definite view. I think you would have to look at the circumstances, the economics of it, what the advantages were, and only then could you decide whether it was best to prohibit the rich or to subsidise the poor. And, and if we look at the issue of deafness, it's, it's not an easy issue. It's not as easy as it seems at first sight, because the claim of at least some deaf people is that they have a culture of their own. They have a culture because they use their own language, sign language, and this gives them a kind of close community uh, which you can't have if you're not deaf. So their argument is that if you don't allow deaf parents to have deaf children, you are effectively destroying their culture. To deliberately cause a, a child to be deaf is something that does eliminate a, a basic capacity which everyone ought to have, at least to the point where they can choose for themselves whether they wish to retain it. Suppose that the child were born with normal hearing and the couple then went to a doctor and said, because we want our child to be part of our culture, we wish you to surgically destroy the hearing of this child. I think that uh, every doctor would refuse to do that, and indeed it would probably be a crime under laws protecting children. So if that is so, then I think we should also not accept the deliberate bringing into the world of a child with this uh, lack of the ability to hear. There, there shouldn't be any difference between the two uh, actions, whether you do it surgically or through genetic selection. What I'm saying is that I don't think we have to allow that in either case. And I think that whatever the couple say, we can still reasonably argue that indeed it is a disability. Um, it's, it's a loss of something that we value, that most of us value, the ability to hear. And if you think about you know, what the child will be without, obviously the child will be unable to appreciate music or the sound of birds in the forest and will perhaps find it more difficult to communicate with other people who don't know sign language um, for example, there's no signing going on now, so those who are deaf are not going to be able to follow this discussion. It, it's ideally, you would have signing wherever you could, but uh, just in terms of resources, it's, it's too difficult. So I think you, you are putting that child at a disadvantage. And while I would, in a way, accept the right of any adult to make that choice for himself or herself, I would not accept the right of parents to make it for their child. There obviously is plenty of room for debate about whether giving money to help animals is going to do more to reduce suffering than giving money to uh, other humans. Um, so you could reasonably take both views, but um, if you take the suffering of animals seriously, then I don't think you should be critical of those who decide that uh, since animals are the most abused and most helpless uh, victims of, of human actions, uh, that may be a very effective thing to do with your money in terms of, of relieving suffering. But to establish that, you simply need to look at the conditions of the animals and try and calculate what change will be made by improving their conditions in whatever way the money will be able to do. In many situations where a person is very ill or um, has had very serious brain injuries from which they will not recover, uh, Catholic theologians will allow you to discontinue treatment. Um, they will say that this is uh, a difference between using ordinary and extraordinary means of treatment. And they will say you're only obliged to use ordinary and not extraordinary means of treatment. But if you actually look at some of the cases, specifically case by case, in which they apply this doctrine, the idea of what is extraordinary varies according to the quality of life of the patient. So what I've tried to argue in a, in a book that does exist in, in Polish, um, it's called uh, Rethinking Life and Death in English, um, I've tried to argue that uh, even people who say they believe that all human life is of equal value do not really um, consistently hold that view, but on the contrary they uh, smuggle into their conclusions about particular cases judgments that are really based on the view that 
quality of life is important and that it does matter to whether you should or should not keep someone alive. What we're talking about, at least for the foreseeable future, will only be available to a relatively small number of people. Um, so uh, natural selection will continue for the overwhelming majority of uh, human, human births. Uh, secondly, I don't really see anything wonderful about natural selection. Um, I mean, natural selection is not uh, morally directed, in my view. It just happens. So uh, the fact that we have now, and, and this is, you know, absolutely unique moment in uh, all of the history of the planet. Uh, the fact that we now have the possibility of, of becoming aware of the forces of natural selection and making some choices about the direction that we would like selection to go in seems to me to be uh, you know, a possibility that we should not refuse. Um, as I said at the beginning, we have to be very careful about avoiding possible dangers and, and uh, harms that could come from it. But I don't think we should simply say that uh, anything that is unnatural in this area of selection is necessarily worse than natural selection.